Hey, you guys. Um, so actually, I don't want to talk about uh, my awesomeness. I want to talk about the awesomeness of HTML and CSS, um, especially as it pertains to your client-side application. So when we talk about HTML and CSS, we're generally talking about the view. I mean, where else would that go, right? Um, but the view, I, I think maybe we, don't, maybe, maybe we don't give it as much respect as the other parts of our application. Um, we tend to see like the view contains a lot of the, the jQuery and the DOM manipulation stuff that, that we don't have in the other aspects of like in the, in the model or the controller or the presenter or whatever else you have in your application. Um, and if you're using some sort of off-the-shelf framework, um, you, you might find that the view is like completely un unimplemented. It's left to you to figure out what's going to go in there. But uh, in fairly recent history, uh, the view sort of was the application uh, to some extent. So like before we, had, before we had XHRs and we were all really interested in like pushing data to the client uh, asynchronously, um, everything, everything was synchronous. We had that request response model and that was, that was the standard way that any website or web application, if you were that sophisticated, worked, right? So the page basically was the application as far as your user was concerned. And then we got into like where we are now, where we have a, a variety of single page applications and that's the, the cool hip way to do things. Um, but that sort of changes the way we think about the view. The view is now just, just a repository, which you could argue it was before, but you know, previously like you might have had, if you had some sort of wizard set up um, back when we called it that, I guess, um, you, you would have a series of pages and you would step through the pages and each page would sort of represent a step in your application. Now your, your view is just kind of, you're throwing things into it, you're, you're throwing data to it, you're, you're throwing like whatever you need from the user, like whatever input fields are gonna collect the input, input that the user wants to give you, um, you just kind of throw that stuff all into the view and you, you manage it client side to some extent, but you don't have that sort of idea of a discrete view that, that is its own kind of jam. But the view is still, it, it remains the end product. It remains what we deliver to the client. It remains what we ask the client to download on their machine. And uh, so it's, it's still, you know, a fairly crucial part of, of what we're delivering. It's, it's, it's the part that we see. It's the, the, to use the tip of the iceberg analogy again, it's the part of the iceberg that we can see above the water um, if, if we're the user of the application. So I, I think a fair definition of a view and, and the HTML and CSS it encompasses is that this is what's, this is what's, represented to, uh, what's presented to the user. Um, it's, it's the only place the user can actually interact with the application directly. And again, it includes the HTML and CSS, not merely the JavaScript that goes in the application code. And we talk a lot about the JavaScript in the context of single page applications and client side applications. Um, there's, there's obviously a variety of cool frameworks you can use. Um, we, we discuss the, the merits of those and the trade offs involved. Um, we talk a lot about ES6 and ES, ES7 and the new features, uh, new, new language features that are coming down the pipe that are going to be available to us to, to allow us to write different kinds of JavaScript and perhaps more uh, you know, strongly typed or formal uh, JavaScripts. And generally, we talk about uh, the, the browser in, um, in, in modern terms, uh, sort of as HTML5 without the HTML. We talk about all the DOM APIs that we're getting, and isn't this stuff cool? And it is very cool, but we talk about it all the time. Um, so I would like to just push JS aside for a second and talk about the rest of it. So this is, this is kind of the scary part when we get to HTML and CSS. For a lot of developers I know, if you came from a back-end background, um, you, you might not have, have ever worked really closely with HTML and CSS. You maybe skipped over that whole DHTML thing and you, you just jumped right in when, when jQuery started making uh, more uh, formal, again, kind of application more possible. Um, and so it can be tricky to, to come into the space of HTML and CSS and try to figure out how to wrangle them, how to make that performant, um, what events to observe, and then sorting out the cross-browser inconsistencies is definitely tricky. You can obviously use good libraries for that, but you still, if you want to do cutting edge stuff, you end up with like brief, rent, vendor prefixes, and um, there's, there's, there's a bunch of little, little quirks that, that we, we isolate ourselves from if we just work in JavaScript. But, 
the, the interesting part to me is that this is the part that you can't mess up. Like the HTML and CSS, again, that's what, that's what you're delivering. So it has to be uh, fairly solid. It's not like JavaScript where nobody can, can necessarily see what you're doing unless they have, they have a, a, an interest in going and viewing your source. Like the HTML and CSS, you, you don't hide that. That's, that's all very visible and it's very tactile for the user. And so if you mess that up, then everyone will know. So I think we need to talk about how we treat HTML and CSS in the context of our applications um, and instead of treating them like, like it's still, you know, the last decade. So come with me on a journey, if you will. Um, let's consider just a simple dot, this little simple dot right here. And this is, this is nothing. It's just, it's just one div. It's one element on the page, and it could be any kind of generic element, um, but div is obviously the most generic, right? So that's why we chose that. Um, it's got an ID. It's got a CSS class. Not a lot to it. And then uh, we give it the styling that it needs to actually become a dot by giving it a background color. Um, we give it some dimensions, and then we uh, round off the corners so that it actually looks like a dot and not a little square. But it's more than that. I, or why would we have it on the page, right? So if we, if we assume that this dot is a larger part of something else, uh, in this case, some sort of graph, it becomes a lot more interesting. So this graph, um, as you can see, um, it, ha it has a bunch of... Uh, it has, it has a bunch of code that, that defines the graph, but essentially it's just a view. It's, it's uh, drawing, uh, it's rendering from a template, and then it's getting a hash of points. And our little dot that we just looked at is one of these points. It has, it has uh, coordinates where it should be rendered. And then um, further down in this view or this module that we're looking at, um, all the points, so the one that we just looked at and all its little buddies, all get rendered and drawn to the screen um, basically by, by setting the, um, the, the CSS properties. So pretty simple. What we know, I think, in the accepted wisdom about HTML and CSS is that HTML is your content. CSS is, is the presentation. It, it's, it's how you, how your content is actually going to look. Um, and together they display information, but they are not the information. The information lives somewhere else. It lives on the server or it lives in some client-side data cache, um, but it doesn't live in HTML and CSS. HTML and CSS are, are merely uh, a mirror for that. And that's wrong. Um, because HTML might actually define your object to some extent. It, it may have all the properties of that object and um, it may become, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, how it might be, be more than simply a, a representation. Um, and the CSS similarly might have data and information that's, that's actually uh, corresponds directly to the information and the properties in your data. And either one of them um, might give that object behavior, um, behavior in the context of your application, not merely user interface behavior, but, but behavior that actually affects the data. Um, and this, this makes it just as, as an important part of your application as the JavaScript that ties it all together. And this becomes really evident when you get the user involved. So our little dot again, um, let's say that we can allow the user to do this. The user can click it and drag it, and we, we can now you know, do that with, with native, um, native uh, properties in HTML5. So we can, we can go around JavaScript completely, and now HTML and CSS actually store the most up-to-date information about this dot. So the dot, if you remember, its only properties were its coordinates. Now its coordinates have changed based on what the user did, and JavaScript didn't do anything. Uh, to, it, JavaScript didn't control that. The user did it, and the DOM allowed it. And so the, the most current information now about this dot and its only two properties comes from somewhere else. It's not JavaScript. So I, I think that's a little mind-blowing. Um, but it still fits the same pattern, right? You have, you have a model that's going to supply your initial data and then you're going to reflect that um, using the view. Um, similarly, the application state, like uh, non-granular data, is going to be reflected, reflected by the view. And what's, what's going to coordinate all that is, is event handlers. That's, I mean, nothing's changed there. Except for who is in control and who's running that kind of show. Um, because now you, you, you can no longer get all that work done with simply assuming that your CSS is static and that it will always be what you loaded on the page. None of those properties will ever change. The server, while all this is going on, just has no clue. Um, you're going to have to coordinate that somehow, and the server is definitely not driving what's happening in the interface and the, the data as it's reflected in the interface. 
um, and the view will just continue to, to respond and to allow the user to do whatever interactions you've enabled um, without waiting for some part of the rest of the application to allow. It's not like you're going to fire off some function that's going to allow every uh, single pixel movement of that little dot. So it's kind of like there's another application behind your application. Um, and you can call this the shadow DOM, you can just call it the DOM, you can call it native browser functions, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the, the browser is obviously its own application and when you start working in the context of what the browser gives you with HTML and CSS, you're, you're basically using another application that, that is uh, secondary and underlies whatever your framework is or whatever application you've built with JavaScript. And sometimes I've, I've seen us screw that up um, in terms of the HTML and CSS. So a couple things that like are easy to, to not do I think are um, over nesting things, um, rewriting behaviors that, that, that already come with, with HTML and CSS that you, you can get just from HTML and CSS in JavaScript, um, just kind of dumping everything in big templates and shipping those down without a lot of consideration to how they'll be used. And then of course taking this sort of defensive approach to CSS where you're just like, oh, something cropped up, quick, add another property and, and hope that'll fix it. So let's look at them in specific very quickly. Um, this is, this is a, a simple, perhaps contrived example of over nesting, but it's something I've seen a lot. Like, if you count the various types of wrappers and containers here, like, you can see that perhaps not all of these are necessary. There's, there's a lot of padding here, um, and presumably these were added to maybe allow for padding so that things could, could line up correctly or like whatever else. Um, but there, there are a lot of hooks here in the DOM that don't represent any actual content and don't seem to really pro provide a lot of information about what's in the page. And so we could easily just kind of squish that down so that we have, we have one wrapper that is presumably um, in, in a data context providing some sort of scope. And then we have a, a child object within that that's all the meta information about everything in that scope um, which allows like some content and a couple actions. And then we have um, the actual content which is isolated from the meta content in its own object. Um, and then we have all the, all the pieces of that content in, in paragraph tags. So we don't have to be so delicate with our HTML. It's, it's not going to break if we don't put enough wrappers around it. Um, and that, that it, it actually creates problems. I mean, obviously, it, it hurts performance. This is fairly well known. We don't want to have too many elements on a page that our selectors have to run through when trying to do something in the DOM. Um, but it also makes our markup uh, less meaningful. And again, this has been discussed and discussed. We know that semantic HTML is good, and we're all on board with that, right? But um, sometimes in the context of an application, we're like, oh, screw the semantic HTML. We need to get this done, and we want to make sure that it works everywhere, so let's just throw a bunch of divs on it. And I think that uh, that's something you have to work to resist as a developer, especially, especially if HTML is not your sort of um, bread and butter because uh, you, you, you can easily get yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, the application works perfectly, but this isn't padded out correctly, so throw a wrapper on it. Um, JavaScript, um, we can also sometimes get into situations where we're, we're using JavaScript to do things that we don't need JavaScript to do. And this is, this is one of the, the simplest examples. You see this all over, um, especially when you're starting uh, with, like if you get started with jQuery, like you, this, this tends to be one of the first things you do. You click something and then you show it or hide it. Um, and you know, that, that seems really cool if you're, if you're not used to working with the DOM because it's, it's very easy and it, it, you don't have to do a lot. And like, indeed, this is only like a couple lines of code, but um, it's still more than we need because we can actually just do this with uh, CSS. Um, if, you have, if you have a browser that supports um, current versions of, of CSS, then you can, you can do all of this completely in CSS and JavaScript doesn't need to do any of that. So. You want to let HTML and CSS do the things that HTML and CSS have been given the ability to do by browser manufacturers. Um, and this, uh, again, this goes back to using things semantically, um, but also understanding that certain semantic elements come with behaviors and like uh, sort of expectations of what they can do, like, like anchors is a, a great and very, very common example, obviously. Um, but also, you know, we have all this cool form validation that we can do now. And like that, that's a very uh, concrete example of like eliminating a lot of JavaScript that we, don't, we no longer have to write because we can do form validation just with our HTML to some extent and all we have to do is sort of respond to, to errors and, and things like that. 
Um, and then if you want to, if you want to list something, if you want to, um, if you want to show a paragraph, like again, those should be in semantically correct tags. But basically you don't want to get your JS involved in things that are only happening, happening visually and only happening in the user interface if it doesn't need to be there. You want to let your, your JavaScript do what it's good at. So uh, messy templating is another uh, pet peeve of mine. So like this, this doesn't look too bad, right? Like uh, it's it's very tidy. Um, we've got uh, we've got several several things happening here, though. We we've got uh, some sort of layout here, obviously, that we're displaying a few different types of things. We're displaying information about the current logged in user, um, and then we're going to show them um, a list of all the the news that they've subscribed to, and then we're also going to give them a form that allows them to add their own news um, to presumably other users' feeds. And that, that shouldn't look like that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about more why in detail later. Um, but basically, you want to try to break that up. So you have, a, you have all these separate things that you're doing in that function. Those should all be their own, or that template, they should all be their own templates. Um, and then your layout should just compose them. So you want to you want to try to uh, when you when you start thinking about templating, start thinking about partials. And, and this it doesn't matter whether you're doing your template on the server or the client or whatever. You still want to have things broken up intelligently. So you want to have partials that correspond to all the objects that are children of whatever main object is is intended to feed the the page or the view that you're looking at. You want to have partials for any sort of widget, um, or at least one, uh, possibly more. Um, you want to be thinking about how you're, you're managing those templates. So presumably, um, you, have, you have the other part of your application that we're not going to talk at all about today, the server. Um, but somewhere on your server, you're taking all these templates and you're compiling them down to actual functions that you can use um, to, to do rendering. And then you're concatenating those into one big file. So you don't have to worry about how many partials you can create. You can create as many partials as you want and be as granular as your application needs to be. And you just like, at the end of the day, you ship one big JavaScript file, and you don't have to worry about like a bunch of HTTP requests or anything like that that might be freaking you out and preventing you from creating partials. And that allows your markup to be consistent wherever you have to use it, because you do have that level of granularity, and you can move these pieces around. And finally, your, your CSS, um, things that it's important not to do. Um, this, this is hopefully old wisdom for some of you, but I, I run into a lot of JavaScript programmers who, who still haven't uh, kind of embraced CSS and um, got, it, got in their hands dirty to some extent. Um, so if you have an, an application or a site where you're using um, unordered lists to, to display things uh, in line, like a series of things in line, but you're like, oh, semantically, this is still a list. But you don't want it, in a, you don't want it to display with bullets. Um, I've seen a lot of people do this. I've seen a lot of CSS resets that do this, um, which irritates me. Well, you just strip all the styling off the unordered list and assume that it, you will never, ever want a bulleted list for an unordered list. And that's great until you have some sort of user-generated content. Um, and then the user-generated content allows you, your user, to put a bulleted list in their stuff. And then you have to go back and strip that off for that specific um, that, that element or, or whatever the container is. And that can be, become unpredictable because you don't really know what's going to be in that container. And typically, your user can't give you, um, a, can't set uh, ad hoc styles on, on their, their content. So if you wanted to give them a button within their user-generated content that allowed them to, to do the same thing, to have inlined unordered lists with, with no bulleted styling on them, um, you would then have to create a class for this. And if you don't know where that class is going to be used and at what depth as far as um, selectors and specificity, then you might end up just resorting to important because you just you simply don't know what you're going to need to override. And I've, I've seen this in reality many, many times. So. This is, I'm not making this up. It happens. And you don't have to do that. Like, uh, Nicole's presentation yesterday, I think, covered this in detail. But just to reiterate, like, this also affects your application and how your application works. Um, so you want to always be, be planning out what you're doing. And you just want to create one class and always use that class to, to do this kind of thing if, if, you're, if you're deviating from the baseline in some way. And again, to, to Nicole's point yesterday, you, you really can't beat uh, a good style guide. And, and it, it's, it's, it doesn't, I, I don't care whether it's a document or not. Like, I, I have no um, professional knowledge about creating style guides. I'm not a designer. But I do know that you need a good inventory of, of what your styles are so that you can, you can have defaults that make sense for your site and are reusable. And um, you have, you have uh, CSS hooks that, are, that belong to CSS. I, I think that we get into trouble sometimes, especially like, um, if, you, if you have like, 
if you've used jQuery plugins, um, who's used like more than five jQuery plugins on a site? Nobody? Okay. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm very proud of the rest of you, but um, I, I have used many, many more than J, uh, five jQuery plugins on a site. And typically, jQuery plugins, um, because they want to be used over and over again as many times as you want on a page, will use a class to, um, as, as their main selector that, that informs jQuery that you want to enhance this, this element, um, which gets tricky when you, you need to do two things to, to that whatever that widget is, that container is, you need to do styling for it and you need to do JavaScript for it. So when you use the same class for those two things, like that, initially that's very cool and very handy and it's tidy, kind of scopes the plugin. But um, if, you, if, if one of those changes, if you need to like modify the class, if you need to remove it because of some state thing um, on either side, then all of a sudden the other, um, the other side, CSS or JavaScript, loses its, its hook into that element. So separate those. Um, and of course, um, if, you're, if you're adding uh, any sort of uh, enhancement, be it, be it visual or be it performance or whatever, um, you, you should just accept that adding another CSS class is a fair price to pay for that because uh, it allows you to keep those, those things separate. Okay. So that's enough, enough negativity. Let's talk, about, let's talk about what we can do to make this more awesome. Creating better views, I think um, you can break it down into a couple of categories. You want to, again, treat your HTML as though, it, as though it's not merely semantic, but it's, it's strongly typed data. Like if, you can, like, if you can get on board with that, I think this becomes a lot easier. Um, you obviously want to be writing good templates, and you want to really think about how you're writing your templates and how you're using them. And uh, you want to you use CSS for something that I think it's extremely good for, um, which, is, which is managing state as, 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 as far as um, things that, that, again, are on that UI layer. And just consider your application as being something that's, that's much bigger than merely the JS code that, that you, is in your application.js file. So starting with HTML, I'm picking on jQuery plugins again. I love jQuery, by the way. But um, HTML is, I think, becoming a lot better than, than most of the, the jQuery plugins we used to rely on in, for certain things. So our friend the dot is back. Um, and this time, I would like you to consider this dot as actually some, actually a tiny little application, which seems like a stretch, but let's talk about it. So the HTML is always going to be part of the user interface layer. It, it represents data whether or not it contains content. Um, and you have, you have a sort of a natural one-to-one -one relationship between an element and a piece of data. But there's also behavior associated with that. Like, you can click on it and, and make things happen. You can drag it around the screen. You can edit it. Um, and if, if, it's, if it's part of a form, then you have a, a whole host of, of enhancements you can make, things that, that will happen automatically without you having to do anything, things like validation and placeholders and that's, that kind of stuff. And it has relationships with the HTML around it. So uh, you can think of nesting as sort of being like namespacing or like, like adding things to, to an object. You can think of lists uh, and the, the relationship between elements in a, a list of any sort as things in an array or things in a hash. Um, you can think of fallbacks for things like uh, media elements as sort of abstract functions that you need to overwrite. And it has proper typing, which hard sell, but um, bear with me. Uh, so obviously we have semantic tags, and like that's to some extent they, they, that allows some sort of typing. Um, we have media elements, which are definitely types, um, fairly, fairly complex types. Um, and then we have all these, these new form element types, um, which, which get really specific. We talk about like, things like phone numbers and email addresses that programming languages don't typically have types for because that's, that's, that's way too granular for a uh, programming language to be concerned with. So there, there, there are like built-in ideas of types, but that's not exactly what we want to talk about. But there, there, are, there are more features in HTML as, as programming language, if, if you can stretch that far, that we don't talk about. So let's assume that this dot has, has some sort of class that it inherits from, and all its buddies do too. And again, it, it's, it's pretty simple because the dot is pretty simple. It's got, it's got its x and y coordinates. It uh, keeps track of the element that is actually rendering the dot. And then there's an update function that will, um, once, once you move it, once the user drags it around, will update the stored coordinates in, in the object itself. 
And so we implement that um, by overriding its properties. We, we, we tell it what element it's supposed to correspond to. We set the initial coordinates. And then um, in this case, we'll, we'll add something extra. Um, and probably we would actually want to add this to the prototype. But since we only have one, um, we want to add some sort of save function that's, that's going to do the updating and then actually post that information back to the server so the server finds out when the user moves the dot around. And I want to ask how far away that is from becoming an application, just, just the things that, that we, we get from HTML and we get from the user interface natively, and then the small amount of JavaScript that we need to sort of run that. And it's probably easier if we move away from the dot example and look at something like a little bit more data driven. So let's say we have an input field here, and the input field has a placeholder um, we, the user can type into it, like many input fields. And then they type into it, they hit enter, and it disappears. We, we've, we've, we don't have the submit button. We've, we've fancied it up with JavaScript so that basically all they have to do is, is type into it, hit enter, and then it, it goes away and it saves. Um, I, think, I think I first saw this like, with, with Flickr, um, back when uh, Flickr like, was sort of pushing, pushing the envelope, really, with uh, UI kind of stuff, where you click into something and like, you get right, right there in line, you get the ability to edit it. Um, but n no, it's fairly common. Um, and it's, it's, it's not hard to do. It's from an, from an HTML perspective, we don't need a lot here. Again, we need one container that kind of gives scope to, to this set of components. Um, and then we get the, the display component and we get the, the input component. And that's pretty simple. Like, not a ton of HTML. There's, there's JavaScript, obviously, involved in running that. But it's, it's pretty small. But it's still a lot more than we need. Um, because we can, we can do the same thing just by throwing a, a content editable attribute on some div or some other wrapper. And all of a sudden, we can do the same thing mouse into it, um, type in it, uh, and then leave it, and it, there it is. And that, that I think, um, becomes even closer to being an application or a, a very small snippet of an application, because it's presenting the data. Um, it's, it's managing the switch between display and edit mode, and it's storing the changes that the user makes. So these are all application concerns that, that are handled by the HTML. So this is the best blogging application that um, anybody's ever, ever written. Um, what we're doing basically is we're tracking whether somebody has edited um, the, the blog text. And then um, there's a couple of handlers, or event handlers, that we're going to throw on there um, so that when, when an edit happens, we will go in and say, yes, somebody's edited this. So uh, cancel, cancel all future updates regarding whether it's been edited. We know it's been edited. We're good. Um, and then we're going to have a, a blur handler so that when the user leaves that, that field, um, we're going to go check and see whether they did some edits while they were there. If they did, great. Let's, let's save that to the server, and then let's reset everything. And you can do the same thing with a framework. Um, similar, you're, you're, you're wiring up your events. You're, you're tracking whether something has been edited, et cetera. And if you, th if you think about like this amount of code, like obviously contrived example, like you probably would want a little more in your blogging application than that. But just, just in terms of how that field, like the main body text of your, your blog uh, post is getting managed, we skipped a ton of stuff. So we didn't write a submit button um, in the HTML, fairly trivial. But that means we didn't need a submit button handler. We didn't need something saying, oh, well, when, when the submit button is clicked, do this. Um, we get the markup and styling for, for both modes um, with, with one set, with one element, perhaps. Um, so again, we, we get the display and edit mode just natively. Um, and then we, we didn't have to write any code to switch between those two, which we would normally have to write with JavaScript. We'd have to hide one and reveal the other, perhaps, again, using a template. So it's easy to integrate this kind of stuff into your application, because all you really have to do is look for the events that, that these things are going to broadcast natively. Um, and then you have to be responsible in your application still for, for storing that on the server or in uh, local storage or wherever you want to you wanna be saving it. You're going to have to do resets for most things yourself. Um, unless, it, unless it's a form, um, you're not going to be able to just have HTML reset back to the initial state if you decide that the, or the user decides that they want to lose all their changes. Um, and if you need polyfills to make some of this stuff work, you would obviously need to do that in, in your JavaScript um, to, to make sure that, that this all works smoothly. But really, that's it. And like, if, you, if you consider all the stuff that you can eliminate, like all the wiring up, all the, all the event handlers that you, you knock out um, by, by relying on the stuff that's built into HTML, it becomes, I think, a very good value proposition. So getting that kind of HTML, of course, into your page uh, begins with having templates that provide that HTML. 
And it takes a little bit of research to find the right template. And I want to kind of underline this because I think it's a mistake that people make over and over again. Um, so you might, you might get a template, uh, a templating engine with your uh, MVC framework or whatever you're using on the client side. You might get one with, the, with your server side framework. Um, and you might be like, we have a templating engine. Done. Wrong. That is wrong. You should, you should choose a templating engine that is specific to what your application needs to do. Because you, there, are, there are a number of, of questions that you should be answering um, before, you, before you decide on one. And so the default choice is not necessarily the best. You need to know whether you're going to try to share these templates between the client and the server. If you're doing client-side rendering, um, you have a different set of concerns than you do on the server. And you have to, you have to figure out how those balance. And, um, but mostly, you have to figure out whether the templating engine you're using can actually be shared. Um, well, the templates can be shared between the client and the server. Um, you need to figure out if your templating engine is one that requires you to have a view model. Do you need to actually transform the data before you can put it into the template in a useful way? You want to figure out your level of granularity. Like, are you going to get as tiny as having a template for each field in a form that's going to contain the field itself, um, the error message, the help text, the, the little checkbox that says when you've verified that that's OK with the server? Or are you just going to have a template that has the whole form in it? Um, and how you're, how you're compiling and packaging these things also affects what you might choose because, uh, again, how you, how you, um, uh, that affects how you, can, how you can split things up, like what level of granularity you can have, but also what needs to go along with that. Like, do you need to push a view model along with your template, and does that need to be part of a package that's delivered together? So bottom line is just to assume that whatever came with your, your framework, whichever side you're using it on, makes perfect sense for the to-do app that is the reference application for your framework, but maybe not for every single use case. And a good baseline when choosing templates, I think, um, is to try and, try and choose something that has a little bit of logic. Um, obviously, you're going to want things like conditionals and iteration. And you, uh, choosing something that, that relies on like CSS classes and re uh, requires you to have, have your data already sort of sorted out um, in the view model and is just going to populate things um, can, can get a little hairy, I think, uh, once you start working with more complex data. Um, if it's on the client side, you obviously want to be caching it. Don't, don't choose something that, that doesn't offer you the ability to cache um, your compiled functions. And uh, at the risk of getting myself in trouble again, um, if, if, if something feels too magical, um, I, I would say maybe, maybe roll it back a little bit and do something that, you have to, that, that requires a little bit more manual effort just because you want to you wanna have tight, tight granular control over your templates because, again, this is, this is how you're delivering your HTML and CSS, which are important. So beginning to work with a template um, generally requires you to write a renderer um, because you want to you be able to manage your caching and loading. Um, some, some templating engines will come with caching and loading management already. A lot won't. Um, if you have to do view model kind of stuff, which, again, in almost any sophisticated implementation of templating, you're going to have to do some data transformation, and it makes sense to couple that to your templates. Um, that a, nat a renderer is a natural place to do that. Um, and of course, because you don't want your, your template API code uh, littering your, your view models or your, or your views, rather, or your controllers or whatever else is in your application. You want this obviously abstracted away so that if you need to switch template engines, for instance, which has definitely happened to me, um, you, you can do that easily and you won't mess up like, all the places that you're actually trying to get stuff rendered. So a, simpler, a simple renderer might look like this. And this, this has a couple things that it, it leaves off if, uh, if you spot them. I, you should pat yourself on the back, um, but let's walk through it real quickly. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to request a template from a cache um, using a, a name that we've given it, and then we're going to um, take the data that we were passed in, um, extend it with, um, with some sort of static data, and so this is already, like, this is, this is fake um, because what you, would, what, what you would probably want to do is be able to compose data from various pieces, and it's, it's unlikely that you just have this big block of static data that's all you need to add to the data that gets passed in. So that's already fake. Um, and if you get a template when you, when you're, you request it from the cache, great. Um, then you'll look to see whether you were passed a container. If you were passed a container, you'll, you'll render the template and stick it in that container. If not, you'll merely return the string that contains the, the rendered HTML. Um, if you were not able to get a, a template by looking in the cache with that name and you were given a URL, then you can go and fetch it. And so this is a second place where, where this is a little bit contrived because probably in addition to being passed a URL, you'd also want to be able to be passed a string that contained the, the template or even a selector if the template was embedded in your HTML. Um, 
So you're going to go and get your partials from um, some cache, and then you'll, you'll go and grab the template that was requested from the server. And um, if you were given a name, then great, you'll put that in the cache in, in its, uh, its compiled version with the partials. If not, you'll simply save that in a local variable, and this is where it gets kind of sketchy. So if you were given a container, then you can take that and put it in a container. If you were not given a container, at this point, you just lost all the work you did. So um, that's, this, this is, this is all the renderer that I could fit on one slide. So, that, but that's, that's, that's merely a subset of the concerns that you would want to handle in, in a, a renderer. So, when you're writing a, a renderer, when you're choosing a template engine, and when you're uh, architecting your, your template solution, you want to think about how you're going to reuse these things. Again, you want to think about whether you're going to need to reuse them client-side and server-side. Um, you also want to think about which pieces of the template are, are Chrome, which, are, which provide the layout that goes around the actual parts of the application that are likely to change. And like, if you're, if you're already delivering templates in, in one templating language that, that fit into the content, content area of your page, like, why would you not want to use those things in the Chrome, especially if, if things are going to happen in the content area of the page, like changing user information that will actually reflect back to the Chrome and, and require the, the Chrome around your page to be changed. Um, you want to figure out which pieces appear in multiple places. What are those places? Obviously, it's, it's very similar to planning your CSS in that way that you need, to, you need to take an inventory and figure out where things show up and what the differences are between them. And part of defining the differences is obviously figuring out the, the conditional display attributes. Um, and uh, a lot of this um, you can actually handle with, with CSS classes. You can do that right in your, in your template rather than having to have a whole bunch of um, state information that gets passed into the template when it's rendered. Instead, you can just use CSS and, and let CSS handle the state so that your, your template becomes more universal for all the places you might want to render it. You also want to consider, again, packaging. I keep uh, talking about this, but it's very, very important because uh, obviously you want to, if you're doing, as soon as you start working with client-side uh, rendering, you're, you're opening yourself up to, to a lot of slowness and a lot of performance issues. So you want to minimize the H HTTP requests that you're doing, obviously. So that involves figuring out what you're going to load by default um, versus what you might want to pull in um, in special cases. Um, it, it involves thinking about whether you need different templates for different user roles um, and also different templates for different languages, which can become a huge, huge deal. Um, templates can be a, a great kind of time saver if you need to do translations and internationalization, but um, how you manage that and what, oh, how exactly that gets driven is, is a really big packaging concern, perhaps the biggest packaging concern, because you don't want to write the same content several times for different languages. You want to have that automatically split, spit out, but then you want to be able to use those, those templates without having to worry about translation, probably on the client side. You probably don't want to uh, pass all that translated content down to the client. So the template contains more than just what gets rendered. It's not simply the visible area of the model. Because a template is essentially an initializer. When you, when you render your template, anything that, that is built in behavior in HTML or CSS that you're doing, that's when that gets initialized. Um, if you think of it just in terms of like JS init functions, it's, it's the same thing. Um, so all, all those behaviors begin, um, they, they become wired up when you, when you render the template. Um, every element state gets set at that point, and to some extent, the application state gets set as well. So you want to have that all kind of well organized. Um, you, you definitely want templates for your content because you don't want to be writing tons of content in your JavaScript at all, ever. Um, if you have widgets um, that you're using, you definitely want one plugin per widget. And by widget, what I'm, what I'm referring to is, is basically a replacement for a jQuery plugin that's not jQuery dependent. Um, and you want to have templates that reflect your application states as well. Um, so if, if your application state gets super advanced and requires a lot of replacement on the page, it, it makes sense just to have a different template for that state. Um, presuming, again, it's something that can't be handled by CSS. So let's talk about the template as the core of a view, which I think sometimes we do and, and sometimes we don't. Um, it really depends on what you're sort of using as your, your application framework bible. Um, 
So if, if you think of this as the core of a view, like you can see that what's happening here is that we're getting, we're getting some template passed in as, as a requirement. And then we're also requiring a few other views. So those would be, those would be your partials, basically. And those are, those are things that, that you're going to use in, in your template. But you're, you're referring to them already as, as objects in your application instead of simply partial templates. They're not just strings. They're, they're their, own, like, their own pieces of the application. And so then you work with that. You initialize it doing the same things that you would normally do. In this case, you're going to manage compiling it yourself. Um, and you're going to set the container, and that's great. And then you're going to observe some data that you passed in. And when that changes, you want to uh, fire off rendering. And then the rendering function just is just calling that goofy renderer that we looked at before. So the idea, um, the, 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 the places where the, the, you this might be different than how you're currently thinking about views. Um, if, if you're thinking about a template-driven view, is that you're going to build up dependencies in your code. So you're, it, you, you can have temp, uh, dependencies defined in your template with, with partials, but that doesn't give you all the information that you really need about those partials, because those partials, again, will have, they'll have event handlers. They'll have perhaps their own partials. They'll have perhaps their own CSS that's necessary for them. And there, there's a whole package that goes along with those partial templates that, that is it inv involves different concerns that you don't necessarily want within the, the actual text of the template. Um, and you can do the same thing with CSS. Like if you have, if you have more advanced CSS um, that you're, you're requiring to, to render something, then you can, you can require that as a dependency as well. And that makes sense um, if, you're, if you're trying to make these, these templates um, really become views and, and build views around them, because CSS is, is an important part of that. Um, so I would, I would recommend upgrading how you think about it. Um, the, the view does not have to be merely a reflection of a model. And if we're talking about things at this level of granularity, again, the, it, it, you may in fact be in a situation where your view doesn't even have a model that it corresponds to. It may be such a small part of the application that it would just be a fragment of an existing model. And you wouldn't want to break your data up that way. Um, you might have a view model that, again, becomes part of that, that module, that view module. But you, you don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence between models and views. And the, the view module that you have should be a, uh, in charge of wiring up its own rendering. It should be responsible for that rather than having to wait for some controller that's aware of it to tell it that it's time to render. Because again, if you, if you start making these things modular, you need each piece to be able to manage itself. And so that's why it makes sense to have these as their own objects, um, even if they are partials, so that they can, they can do all this work themselves. And you can, you can require that in your dependency tree and then you, you build up things that, that have all the behaviors you want and all the styling you want and everything assigned to them already. So oh, uh, let's talk about magic again. Um, and I would argue that all the magic you ever need in any application, you can deliver with CSS. If you want things to happen under the covers that you can't necessarily observe, CSS is a great way to do that. And it, it actually is a great way to do that. Um, so typically, when we talk about CSS in our views, we're talking about one big file that we expect to be there um, when we load the page. And uh, then you know, we, might, we might change that file out if, the, if there's a page change, even if it's a single page app. If we go from one, like, one state uh, of, of the application to a very different one, we might swap the CSS. But we don't think of it as being tied directly to the application. And why do we not think about it that way? Because there's a lot in CSS that we can use in our application. At the very minimum, again, CSS provides state information. It tells you where you are in a workflow. Uh, it tells you how things change depending on the role of the logged in user. It tells you when there's an error, um, even if it's just you know, red text. It, it tells you something about that. Um, and if you're drilling down, if you're expanding things and showing and hiding things, it shows you to what level you've drilled down. But it might also have things like, like data. Uh, you can have content in your CSS. You can uh, have really cool animations that are fairly complex. Um, and you can have the triggers for those animations, like the, the example we looked at before. Um, you can also have application workflows. When you piece all those, those various components together, you can, you can get something that's a little bit more sophisticated. And that can be defined in your CSS to some extent. And these are all pieces of your application. These are all things that your application needs to know about, and they need to be managed as though they were. So we want to start with um, some kind of object-oriented CSS kind of, kind of idea, because your, your JavaScript objects in your application are already presumably modular. 
Um, and we just talked about putting HTML in templates which go in views that are also modular. And then once you have the, those kind of modules, you can, you can compose them uh, with your dependency manager and, and chain them together, and that's great. And so you want to be able to do the same thing with CSS if you want to take advantage of it in your application. So you have, you, you have your de default CSS still, and that really hasn't changed. You, you still want to do your normalization in one place. Set all your, your fonts and, and all, the, all the layout stuff, your grid. You want to set all that up in your default. Um, all the generic error states that you know will be common across the application or provide a baseline. Any sort of generic widget styling that you're going to need for, for different widgets that, that do similar things, like an overlay, for instance, you're going to want to have a big fat border on that so that it, it masks the rest of the page. Um, and any kind of composable properties, um, like a uh, referring back to Nicole's talk again, um, for instance, ClearFix, um, things like that, that that sort of decorate the, the, the main goal and the, the main styling needs of, of whatever the element is. But then outside of that, it's nice to have the ability to lazy load your CSS as a template. Um, this works great for things that you're optionally adding on, things that you, you might not see a lot. Um, again, going back to the, the same metric that you would apply to templates, um, if, you, if, you, if you think that you're only going to need it in certain instances, um, it, it makes sense to lazy load it, obviously. But it's also really great for A-B testing, um, especially if you have if you have your CSS rendered by a template so that you can, you can change variables and uh, mess with things on the fly that, that uh, respect the, the state of the application and, and where you are in it, um, and uh, obviously any configuration values that are needed for your, your A-B testing. Um, translated content, again, that makes sense in CSS if you, um, not only if you're, if you're putting content in your CSS, but also, you know, if you want to change the, the left to right, um, the way things read, you, you might need different CSS for that. Um, and of course, for your interactions, uh, which is perhaps the, I think, the most interesting part. Because you don't have to wait for your JavaScript to be changing the state of your application. Um, like this first example, let's say that you have, you have a large body of content on your page, and then you have a, a button at the top that makes that high contrast. You can do that just with CSS. So you can, you can change the, the, the background color and the, the foreground color, and then change the font size so it's easier to read without ever having to go to JavaScript. Um, and similarly, if, you, if you're going to suddenly change the, the user role um, by, by assigning a, a class to the body, um, you, can, you can show and hide things um, so you can toggle back and forth. For instance, if you were doing some sort of, uh, if, if you, were, you, you had the ability in your site to log in as an administrative user, but also go through and like, turn your admin rights off so that you could, you could see what the page looks like to a normal user, something like that. So the, the CSS can, can be part of your widgets and, and sort of take care of some of the work for you, which is really cool, because you don't need to, you don't need to rely on JavaScript for that, because if, if, if it's just visual stuff, CSS is able to manage that. So anything that it's going to change your display properties, um, CSS can do. Showing and hiding, again, it's a natural place for CSS to do that work rather than JavaScript. And of course, triggering CSS animations, if you can do that with CSS as well, awesome. And then, you know, your code is that much more baller. So uh, just generally using the CSS behavior in your application um, is, it's, it, it, it's I, I don't want to say that I lied to you, but um, it, you don't really use it in the same way that you, do, you use other things. Um, because uh, in terms of the JavaScript, you don't need to do a lot of wiring, uh, wiring up for the, the CSS behavior that you might want to use, because you're basically listening to the same events that, that your JavaScript would be listening to and responding to those with CSS. So if you, if you think of it that way, it makes sense to have the, the CSS and the JavaScript separate, and you actually probably wouldn't want your JavaScript to refer to that CSS. And this is easy, again, when you treat your CSS as a module. So tying everything together, um, how does this all kind of combine? The idea, basically, that I'm trying to sell here is that you will write an application that leans heavily on CSS and jo or HTML and CSS wherever possible, um, and, and gets, squeezes the most value out of those things because there's a lot of value in them, and you can, you can still watch that with your application. You can still manage it with your application, especially if, you're, you, know, if you have smart modules and you're, you're putting things together intelligently. Um, you want to trust the DOM to, to do the things that the DOM is actually good at and is already empowered to do on its own. And you want to make sure that you're, you're allowing JavaScript to narrow its responsibilities back down to things that are more programming language-y. 
um, things like like managing data, things like like firing off chains of events, um, things like that. That that's that's what JavaScript's really good at, and I, I think anybody who's ever worked in like a lot of DOM scripting would probably agree that it would be nice to remove some of that DOM scripting from JavaScript and just let JavaScript sort of run applications. So, and again, treat everything, just treat everything as a module. And this becomes, this becomes fairly easy if you, if you start considering HTML and CSS in that same way. And then hopefully you get applications that are that much more awesome as a result. So that's it. Thank you.